A few housekeeping measures to note before we get started, however. This webinar is being recorded and the presentation will be sent to all registrants. Also, everyone entered the webinar today in listen-only mode, so please submit your questions using the chat feature. All questions will be collected and asked at the end of today's joint presentation. I'll now turn it over to our colleagues at the DOJ and HHS. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Kavon Small, as I was introduced previously. I'm an attorney in the Federal Coordination and Compliance Section, which is one of 11 sections within the Civil Rights Division. I'm here with my colleague, Dylan DeCavore, who has so graciously allowed me to take the lead for our portion of this presentation. I'm going to spend the first 20 minutes with you and then turn it over to Brandy and Carla. And our overall goal for this presentation really is to show or to discuss and describe how child, civil, how child welfare and civil rights really go hand in hand. So we will go over applicable federal civil rights laws, including Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and then we're going to talk a little bit about our collaboration together between HHS and DOJ, and throughout our presentations, we're going to try to weave in some examples. And we are looking forward to our discussion at the end. So for those of you who are not familiar with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which I will refer to as Title VI, think about, or if you can remember, or if not, maybe you've heard about it in history, what was going on in the United States in the 1960s. There was this very um, well-known march called the March for Jobs and Freedom in Washington, D.C., and one of the primary slogans that came out of that march was, no U.S. dough to help Jim Crow grow. And that is something that we in FCS, and FCS is the Federal Coordination and Compliance Section, where we primarily enforce Title VI, and our enforcement can not only be investigations of people who receive DOJ money, but through our coordination authority, we also work with our sister agencies or sister sections within the Civil Rights Division to make sure that there is consistent enforcement of Title VI. So the, the impetus in, in, in enacting Title VI was to prevent subsidizing discrimination with federal funds. We don't want U.S. money to further discrimination. It was also to ensure the uniformity and permanence to the non-discrimination policy eliminating the need to debate discrimination in each funding bill. It was also to address grants that were issued under, under the separate but equal doctrine that permitted discrimination. And also, really, as an alternative to litigating each instance of alleged discrimination, it wanted to provide for an administrative process or administrative relief for people who believe that they are victims of discrimination. So what does Title VI say? No person in the United States shall, on the ground of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal fi financial assistance. We really believe that actions taken to comply with this statute can be used to help determine reasonable efforts. So on the ground of race, color, or national origin, this means any perceived race, color, or national origin, even if it's not actual, even if someone perceives you to be of a certain race, color, or national origin, they cannot discriminate against you, whether you are here legally or whether or not um, you do not have the appropriate paperwork to be in the United States. Title VI protects all people, regardless of your immigration status. And national origin can include an individual's language, culture, ancestry, and other social characteristics. In our work in the Federal Coordination and Compliance Section, we have a state court's language access initiative, and it was really through making sure that people who were limited English proficient had meaningful access to state court uh, operations and proceedings. We came to become a lot more involved in child welfare work through child custody hearings, um, dependency hearings, and it was through that, through our, the cases that we were receiving through our state courts initiative that we also really began working with HHS. So for us in the language access context for Title VI, recipients must take reasonable steps to provide meaningful access. Each LEP individual eligible to be served or likely to be encountered in their programs or activities have to be pre-provided with an interpreter or with in in translated documents in a language that is meaningful to them. Meaningful access can be achieved, as I said, through oral or written language assistance services provided free of charge and in an accurate and timely manner. 
Such services can include providing translated documents, providing qualified interpreters. All of that is to say you have to meet people where they are. And that is what we really try to do. We try to help state court systems make sure that people are going through that. Can you imagine if you were a mom or a dad and you are going through a custody proceeding and you don't even understand like when you're supposed to show up, what the paperwork says, what um, are the allegations being lodged against you or why somebody wants to terminate your parental rights. We have had those cases come through our office and we work really hard to make sure that something that's so important as understanding what's happening in your life with your child, you can be a meaningful participant in. So, comply, so again, complying with your Title VI requirements where if you receive our money, you have to make sure that that mom or dad, grandparent, any witness, sibling or child, they understand what's going on. We try to make sure that if you do that, then that's how you can also start to assess whether or not reasonable efforts have been made. So I'm going to skip over this slide because that's basically the example that I just gave you. I'm trying to save some time. So how do we officially get involved? Our jurisdiction comes through the money that we give out. As the statute says, if you receive federal financial assistance, then you are subject to the obligations of Title VI. Now the easiest way to think about this is the money that the federal government may give out. But there's other ways that we can provide federal financial assistance, even if it's not just money. It can be grants or donation of federal property, a detail of federal personnel. For example, if we go to work in a state or local entity's office free of charge, the sale or lease or commission to use our federal property, say, for example, you set up a benefits office, a state or local entity sets up a benefit office, and they do it in a building that we own. If we allow you to run that benefit program um, at a reduced rate or free, then that's us giving you federal assistance and you're subject to our Title VI, to Title VI obligations. Or really any con federal contract for the provision of assistance. So the goal is if you receive something from the US, then you have agreed and you actually sign, you actually sign documents agreeing to make sure that you do not discriminate on the basis of race, color, or national origin. So examples of people who receive assistance or Title VI type or assistance where Title VI obligations would um, attached could be county child welfare agencies, state court systems, service providers, but also consider other systems such as public transportation systems, housing authority, unemployment services, and public benefit services. Because what we always try strive to say is that life does not happen in a vacuum. So when you are presented with a set of facts, really think about all of the different ways in which the federal government may be involved in that one particular case because then we could reach out to all of those different agencies to see if they're also providing some money to sort of see how we can collaborate together to make sure that the end result whether it's on an individual for an individual or for a system can have the greatest impact so when we receive a complaint in our office there are three primary i would say really two primary ways that we assess the evidence so you can either do it through a lens or a method of proof called disparate treatment, which is intentional discrimination, or discriminatory effects, which is disparate impact, and then retaliation, which is another form of disparate treatment, which I'll talk about. I'm going to talk about all of these in a second. So let's start with intentional discrimination. Intentional discrimination is when similarly situated persons are treated differently, at least in part because of their actual or perceived race, color, and national origin. Here, the recipient, the person who receives our funds, the state or local entity that receives the federal government's funds, has to be aware of the person's race, color, or national origin. And that actor should have, will have to have acted at least in part because of that person's race, color, or national origin. They, we don't have to show, in order to substantiate a claim of intentional discrimination, we don't have to show that the recipient or the person who received our funds had any bad faith or any ill will. The Supreme Court has said, you don't have to worry about the motive. If someone acted because of someone's race, color, or national origin, then that could help substantiate a claim of intentional discrimination. If you believe that you have a set of facts that would fall under this category, you can file. The Supreme Court said you can file your claim with the court. You can file a private lawsuit, but you can also file a claim with administrative agencies. Administrative agencies do still have their basis or they all have always had the basis to review claims of intentional discrimination. They don't just have to be filed in court. So how do we prove intentional discrimination? I'm going to lump these into two primary categories. 
One would be based on evidence that's direct evidence of a discriminatory motive, or number two and three, the Arlington Heights mosaic of factors and the McDonnell Douglas framework are two methods of proof that really rely on indirect or circumstantial type evidence, which is a more, the most common type of evidence that we come across in the complaints that we have seen. You can file a claim with our office under one or a combination of these frameworks. And if you don't know the framework yourself, send us your facts and we will assess them either under, um, based on how we view the case and whatever evidence we may uncover, we'll figure out exactly where it falls. So let's start with a very quick example. A statement of an official involved in a decision stating that an assembly, assembly race-neutral action was taken in order to limit minority individuals' eligibility for a federally funded program or program is evidence of race-based intent. For example, what if I'm a, I am a recipient official and in my office I say, you know what, I know about these people. They really know, they really work hard, they don't need these benefits. I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to deny all of their requests for assistance because I know these people and where they come from, from their country, they work really hard. They don't need this money. They don't need these services. They don't need this food. If that is what I am saying, whether I say it orally or I actually put it down on a piece of paper, that's direct evidence of intent. So if I'm wearing my federal government reviewer hat, if I come across evidence of that, I'll say, you know what? I have enough to, substan to substantiate a claim of intentional discrimination. In addition to intentional discrimination, there's another theory called disparate impact discrimination that is not found in the statute itself, but it's found in our Title VI regulations. DOJ has Title VI regulations, but also 26 federal agencies have Title VI regulations, and they primarily use the same language that we have in our DOJ regulations. So if you have a neutral policy or practice that disproportionately and adversely impacts protected individuals based on race, color, and national origin, and you can achieve the objectives in a less discriminatory way, then we're going to say, look, you can't engage in that neutral practice if it has the effect or it has an impact and disproportionately affects people who can be classified under race, color, or national origin protection. The Supreme Court has said, while you can file an intentional discrimination complaint either in court or with a federal agency, you can only file a claim based on a theory of disparate impact discrimination with a federal agency. So we, we know that we are the one-stop shop for that. We can take a disparate impact claim and, and the federal government itself can file it in court, but you as a private citizen or an individual, you can only come to an administrative agency for that type of case. To prove dis disparate impact discrimination, we would have, again, to show that the harm falls disproportionately on a protected, um, pr protected person. The harm in this case does not have to be substantial. It can be any type of harm. A lot of people, a lot of the complaints we see, they spend so much time trying to demonstrate harm. Oh my God, it is so severe, it's so compelling. You can have a compelling set of facts that are not like a child was burnt beaten, bruised, battered, and, you know, shoved under a car. I mean, harm can come in many different ways. And the Supreme Court has said that harm does not have, can be minimal in order for it, it to still substantiate um, the harm requirement. Um, then once we can demonstrate that, the, our recipient is then given an opportunity to say, look, here's my justification for why I had, I, I engaged in this particular type of action. Our, us as the reviewing agency will say, look, is that a substantial legitimate justification for this policy or practice? We have a lot of discretion in that regard to say, no, this, this, this actually, um, they have a good reason for why they did this. But if we can then say to our recipient, are there less discriminatory ways that you could achieve your same objective? Your objective was great, but there's a better way that you could achieve that. That's something that we work with them to try to um, to make happen. And that's where a lot of our work is spent, is really trying to say, hey, look, we understand what your goal is, but your goal is having an impact on people in this very negative way. Let's look at other ways that we could try to change the same objective. And we spend a lot of time, we spend sometimes even years working with our recipients to try to achieve that less discriminatory alternative. 
But there are some cases, and I want to be very frank, there are some cases where our recipient has a really good goal and we find that they have tried to build in as much mitigation or they really have studied um, this problem and they can't figure out another way to do it. We can't figure out another, another way to do it. So for that very limited set of circumstances, we may say that we're going to allow our recipient's actions to stand. Going back to intentional discrimination, one thing that we have often started to see come up in our cases is retaliation. So for example, if someone files a complaint with any one of our agencies and they then they believe, say for example, it's a someone who works in a public benefits office. And she's like, look, I know that they're just purposely not awarding services to a certain type of family. If she then realizes, wow, I'm now getting bad assignments at work, or are, that in, it, in and of itself is intentional discrimination because that's an intentional act. That's retaliation. And that's prohibited by the statute. And there's also, it's also prohibited in our regulations. And we take those complaints very seriously. We also say that even if you are the recipient and you receive our funds and you want to say that a third party is the person who was intimidating the person who filed the complaint or was a witness, we say to our recipient, you still have an obligation and you can still be held liable for Title VI violations if you do not take adequate steps to make sure that harassment or retaliation is not taking place um, at all. So anyway, I'm trying to very quickly go through my section. Okay, it looks like we are back. Apologies to everyone. Please let us know if you can hear us now. And we'll give folks just a minute. Great. Perfect. We're happy you can hear us. Sorry about that, everyone. We'll get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, I thank my colleague, Kavan, uh, for her uh, wonderful presentation on Title VI. I'm going to go ahead and turn to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, my name is Brandi Wagstaff. I am a trial attorney in the Disability Rights Section at the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice. The Disability Rights Section has the primary responsibility for implementing and enforcing the Americans with Disabilities Act across the country. The ADA, which I will refer to it as, is a comprehensive civil rights law that seeks to ensure an equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities to participate in all facets of our nation's economic, civic, social, and cultural life. The Disability Rights Section writes the regulations implementing Titles II and III of the ADA. It enforces all titles of the ADA, and it has a statutory mandate to provide technical assistance to educate covered entities and persons with disabilities about their rights and responsibilities under Titles II and Title III of the ADA. I'm 
I'm trying to advance the slide, but it's not working. So give me one second while someone assists me. There we go. So Title II is uh, the provision of the ADA that is relevant to the work that we are doing in the child welfare context. Title II prohibits disability-based discrimination in all programs, services, and activities of over 80,000 state and local governments, and that includes child welfare agencies and the courts. Title II of the ADA provides that no qualified individual with a disability shall, by reason of such disability, be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of the services, programs, or activities of a public entity, or otherwise be subjected to discrimination by such entity. The ADA's coverage under Title II is very broad. It applies to all program services or activities of public entities, which includes any state or local, local government or agency. So in the child welfare context, it has application to, among other things, investigations, witness interviews, assessments, case planning and service planning, foster care, and reunification services. The ADA is also broad in terms of its protections for persons with disabilities. A disability under the ADA is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, such as caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, breathing, standing, lifting, speaking, learning, concentrating, eating, sleeping. As you can see, it, it covers a, a wide range of major life activities, or a wide range of daily activities. Major life activities also include the operation of major bodily functions. So that includes functions of the immune system, uh, cell growth, digestive system, bowel, neurological, endocrine system, and reproductive function. So even if an individual's substantially limiting impairment can be mitigated through the use of, say, medication or devices or assistive technology like hearing aids, that individual is still protected by the ADA and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. They still fall under the definition of disability, even if they have these mitigating measures that help to control um, certain conditions or to help mitigate certain effects of their disability. The ADA also applies to people who have a record of impairment, such as military records or employment records denoting that this person had an impairment or are regarded as having an impairment, even regardless of whether they actually have a physical or mental impairment or not. If somebody believes that you have such impairment, then you fall under the protections of the ADA. In the child welfare context, it's important to note that under Title II of the ADA, um, an individual with a disability and under Section 504 as well, does not include an individual who is currently engaged in illegal use of drugs when the agency acts on the basis of illegal drug use. But an individual is not excluded from the protections of the ADA in Section 504 on the basis of illegal drug use if that person has successfully been rehabilitated or is participating in a supervised rehab program or is no longer engaging in legal, illegal drug use. So that's just an important point to remember. I get a lot of questions about that because it does come up so frequently in the child welfare context. In the child welfare context, the ADA and Section 504 protect individuals with disabilities who are parents, children, legal guardians, relatives, caretakers, foster parents, and prospective foster or adoptive parents. It also protects individuals from being discriminated against on the basis of an association with someone who has a disability. So for example, it would prohibit an agency from refusing to place a child with an otherwise qualified foster adoptive parent because the parent has a friend or relative that has HIV. It also protects companions with disabilities of individuals who are involved in the child welfare system when that companion is an appropriate person with whom the child welfare agency should communicate. So 
one of the things that we like to emphasize in this presentation are the common goals, the mutual goals of both child welfare and non-discrimination under the ADA. So Title II of the ADA and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act have always applied to state and local child and family services programs, prohibiting them from discriminating against biological foster and adoptive and prospective parents with disabilities in conducting their services and activities. While a child and family service agencies have, while, sorry, excuse me, while child and family service agencies have an important obligation to protect children from abuse and neglect, they must do so without discriminating on the basis of disability and must be prepared to reasonably modify their policies, procedures, and practices when such modifications are necessary to ensure that parents and children with disabilities can participate equally in their programs, and that includes reunification and support programs. They must not assume that people with disabilities are incapable of benefiting from their services or are incapable of being good parents. Those are invalid assumptions that um, child welfare agencies uh, should not be making um, on, in, um, these, uh, pr in providing these services. The goals of child welfare and disability non-discrimination are mutually attainable and complementary. In other words, the rights of parents and children are not antagonistic. Ensuring that parents with disabilities have equal access to parenting opportunities will increase opportunities for children to be placed in safe and caring homes. Um, so I am at this point um, going to turn it over to my colleague from HHS. Carla Carter, who is making her way over here, and I'm going to take her my hand. Thank you, everyone, and good afternoon. Um, my name is Carla Carter, and I'm a civil rights analyst with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights. HHS is the um, federal agency that primarily funds child welfare services. And so I think it's important that um, folks are familiar with the Office for Civil Rights because our office is responsible for ensuring that all recipients of HHS funds do comply with the various <coughs> civil rights laws. We are located in 10 regional offices, and that's throughout the United States. And our staff is primarily responsible for investigating complaints involving um, 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 discrimination in the context of child welfare. And that's both by uh, state child welfare agencies and other recipients. We have a national office in which I'm based out of where um, we write policy and issue guidance to help our recipients comply with the law. So I want to very briefly go over um, the laws that are that OCR has responsibility to enforce, um, like the Department of Justice, OCR is responsible for um, enforcing Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, Title IX of the Education Amendments, and and we usually use that um, authority when we're looking at um, educational programs. And so when you think about educational programs and child welfare, we'll think about parenting skills programs that may be run by the agency itself or other kind of um, group. Um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, the AIDS Discrimination Act of 1975, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Multi-Ethnic Placement Act of 1994 um, as amended, and uh, that's MEPA, and then Section 1557 of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. OCR also um, has jurisdiction to um, investigate HIPAA complaints and complaints involving um, the security rules. So I'll briefly go over Section 504 of the Rehab Act, and so because Section 504 really does mirror all of the protections for individuals with disabilities that are provided under the ADA. Um, one distinction is that it only applies to recipients of federal financial assistance. And so that's important um, because it gives us 
and into the agencies in ways that are a little bit unique. And so um, under 504, if an entity receives $1 of federal financial assistance, HHS has the ability to reach all aspects of their program. Um, in accepting HHS funds, recipients are required to provide written assurances, and that's something that when we're doing presentations, oftentimes um, line staff are not aware that their agency has, filed, has um, provided assurances that they will comply with the various civil rights laws. And so this is why these presentations are very important, because we're reaching out to you guys directly. Um, some of the remedies that are provided under Section 504 um, is the suspension or termination of HHS funds, which certainly has an adverse effect. Um, we can refer it to the Department of Justice, Department of Justice for enforcement, and there's a private right of action under the law. So I'm sure most are familiar with NEPA, and I'll just go over it um, very briefly. So um, section, um, Title uh, 4B and 4E agencies, and those are agencies that receive funding from the Administration of Children and Families, um, are prohibited from delaying or denying the placement of children into foster care or for adoption on the basis of the foster adoptive parents' race, color, and national origin, or that of the child involved. In a sense, you cannot use race um, color or national origin to determine a placement unless it's been determined it's in the child's best interest and there's a whole set of step, steps that agencies must go through in order to um, use race or any of those uh, other protective factors um, in that decision making. It also prohibits agencies from denying anyone um, the opportunity to become a foster adoptive parent on the basis of their race, color, and national origin. And so that's, you know, particularly important because in, in a lot of the work that we've seen, we've had um, folks who might be of a different race who are looking, for example, a white family looking to um, adopt an African-American child and simply on the basis of the, the applicant's race that they're denied that opportunity. And that would, you know, that would, um, that would, um, violate the law. And it's important to know that a violation of NEPA is also a violation of Title VI. And so when we're looking at child welfare in NEPA, we're really looking only at foster and adoption services. But it, um, Title VI is much broader and hits all angles. So I think it's important to kind of tie all of this together. So we've talked to you about a lot of the different laws um, but how does this really apply to um, the child welfare system? And one of the analogies I'd like to draw is that complying with federal civil rights laws is also um, a good way to ensure that you're making reasonable efforts to work with families. Um, and that is to assist the families in remedying the conditions that brought them and their children to the attention of the child welfare agency. Uh, to the attention of the Child Welfare Agency. So non-discrimination provisions require that agencies treat individuals on a case-by-case -case basis consistent with the facts of their family. So that means you can't just assume that all African-American families are, um, have you know, these kind of problems or all families with um, individuals with disabilities require these services. So you have to look at each individual family and determine whether or not these services are appropriate for them. It also requires that you provide equal access to services and programs and activities without creating or impo imposing artificial barriers. And so when, when I think about the non-discrimination provisions, I also think about how this is very similar to reasonable efforts which require that child welfare services be accessible, available, and culturally appropriate for the families that, they're, um, that, that are, are receiving services. And so it's real important when you're thinking about the reasonable efforts, or you could also think about, oh, well, you know, have I met the obligations of the federal civil rights law? And again, 
um, non-discrimination laws do not require that agencies lower standards. So we're not saying that you're going to place a child at risk in order to accommodate a parent or provide equal services. That's always an overwhelming um, position of the Child Welfare Agency that is the goal to ensure children are safe. But in doing so, you have to think about these other factors. So in 2014, OCR um, and DOJ came together to really brainstorm and how we can um, address some of the issues that were being raised um, as we were starting to look at these complaints. And we could see um, a, really uh, an increase in the flux of complaints involving um, discrimination on the basis of disability and race, color, national origin. Folks are not getting access to services. And, and we wanted to figure out, is there a way to use our federal um, regulations to address that? And, and so we decided that the best bang for our buck is for us to work together um, to address um, these issues. And so we have a um, we have a child welfare initiative where there's several agencies and we meet on a monthly basis and talk about some of the issues that are emerging from our work. Um, we um, also uh, talk about different ways in which we can do joint investigations. Um, certainly, we are do joint enforcement, and some of you may be familiar with the Massachusetts letter of finding, and I think Brandy's going to get back to that in a couple of minutes. But also, you know, it was real important for us to um, issue guidance, and so we, we understanding that we can't reach every person, um, we thought, well, maybe, you know, as, a, as federal agencies, we should talk about the kind of um, issues that we're seeing, and so we issued a disability rights technical assistance that followed a violation of letter violation letter of finding out of Massachusetts. And then we also issued a Title VI guidance that talks about the obligations of agencies to comply with um, Title VI. And as part of your um, handouts, you should have you should have um, both the technical assistance documents as well as some fact sheets from HHS and I you guys as well and <laughs> DOJ as well. So I, I think it's important to spend a little bit of time of talking about what discrimination in the child welfare context looks like. And so um, if I were standing before you, my eyes would get really, really wide and I would, you know, give you this terrible hypo, but I'm not going to do that, <laughs> Cause, but my eyes really are wide. <laughs> so um, the first case I want to talk about is um, a, um, a letter of concern that we issued to Washington State. And the issue that we investigated was um, we had received a complaint that Washington State had set up a separate child welfare system for African Americans. And it didn't matter where in within this one region African American families live, all African American families or any family any family that had an African American family member or even a biracial um, family member were all shuttled to one um, county office to receive services. And so um, we had and, and, and as, as Kavon had mentioned earlier, you know, it's not always that there was some malicious intent. It was really a concern that African American families had some specific and unique needs and they wanted to make sure that um, they had the best staff available to work with these families. But certainly this was treating African American families different from other families because other families were receiving services within their own communities and African Americans had to travel sometimes at great length in order to receive services. And so in this um, regard, OCR worked with the state agency to ensure that they, um, one, dismantled that program and also, you know, began this process of um, 
getting African American families back to services within the communities as every other family did. Another um, example of discrimination is um, the Mississippi Department of Human Services, and all of these um, all of these uh, examples are on our website, and I, there's a link at the at the end of the slides um, that will take you to, to our enforcement page. But in this regard, it was the mother um, who spoke an indigenous dialect, and she was denied opportunities to um, one have reunification with her child, but also basic services. And so this was a mother who spoke. Um, an indigenous dialect, Chatino, and the state agency did not have uh, a Chatino um, interpreter. In fact, there are only two in the country. Um, a Google search would have allowed the agency to find one, but they didn't. But our staff found the uh, two interpreters. And, and so in this regard, there was an assumption that because she was Mexican, that she spoke Spanish, and so all of the interpreters provided to her were Spanish speaking and also the agency um, would only give her documents in English and so clearly this was not giving mom any opportunity. When we were finally um, able to secure the interpreter and to interview mom about the circumstances of the agency's involvement, she spoke at great length for almost an hour about how upset she was that she went into the hospital in labor and no one understood her, and then they took her baby, and she didn't know she had to go to court because all of the documents that were provided to her were in English. And so this was um, a, a really great opportunity for OCR to come in and illuminate this issue and to work with the state of Mississippi to really build a language access um, program within the child welfare. It's important to note that Mississippi and all of its other services, Tana and Medicaid and child care, already had a full robust um, language access program. But in child welfare, which was literally across the hall from these other services, uh, staff did not know how to access those services. So we spent a good amount of time doing some technical assistance. And I'll just jump to the last um, case, which is the Georgia Department of Human Resources, and this was a case involving a, an individual with a disability that sought to become um, a foster and adoptive parent, and the agency determined that there wasn't a single child in foster care that she was able to care for, and this was based on their assumptions about her condition and how it manifests and wasn't based on an individualized assessment. OCR issued a violation of letter of finding, and Georgia came into compliance after some um, extraordinary work on their part. So at this point, I'm going to stop, and Randy's going to talk about the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families. Hi, everyone. Thanks again. Um, so I'm going to refer to the Massachusetts Department of Children and Families in um, my discussion as DCF, as for shorthand. So DOJ and HHS jointly investigated a complaint that involved a then 19-year-old woman, Tara Gordon, whose two-day-old daughter was removed from her custody by DCF while Ms. Gordon was still in the hospital recovering from childbirth. From the outset of its involvement with Ms. Gordon, DCF was aware that she had an intellectual disability. So as part of her intellectual disability, Ms. Gordon is a visual learner. She requires repetition, model behavior, and hands-on assistance in a natural and safe environment in order to, to learn skills. At the time DCF took custody of Ms. Gordon's baby, she had been living at home with her parents who had planned to help her raise the child. So Ms. Gordon's mom had even quit her job um, so that she could stay at home full time and help her daughter care for the baby. Um, but the child was still removed. After seven months of providing very minimal supports and services that were not tailored to Ms. Gordon's learning style, DCF changed the goal for the child from reunification with her family to adoption. After the goal was changed to adoption, DCF continued to provide only minimal supports and services to Ms. Gordon. DCF failed to provide Ms. Gordon with appropriate services listed in the DCF regulations that would have accommodated her disability and required Ms. Gordon to complete tasks that experts advise are entirely inappropriate due to her disability. 
so um, they were asking her to do things that were beyond her capability, not uh, appropriately accommodating um, her disability during these um, the, the limited services they were providing and limited visitation. So over the course of approximately 18 months following DCF's removal of her daughter, Ms. Gordon and others on her behalf made numerous requests for reasonable modifications that she needed due to her disability. So for example, she requested increased parent-child visits home visits and hands-on demonstrations during visits so that she could fulfill the task and learn the parenting skills that DCF was requiring of her to reunify with her daughter. In addition, experts who had evaluated Ms. Gordon during the course of her involvement with DCF provided written reports explaining the services and supports that she needed due to her disability, but DCF repeatedly denied Ms. Gordon's reasonable modification request. The court-appointed attorney for Ms. Gordon's daughter, uh, she even supported reunification with Ms. Gordon as long as they had the appropriate supports in place. Um, the child's attorney also repeatedly advised DCF that she believed the agency was violating Ms. Gordon's rights under the ADA in Section 504 by denying her the opportunity to benefit from supports and services. So you even have the child's parents on her side telling DCF you're getting it wrong. On January 29, 2015, a DOJ issued a joint letter of findings with HHS concluding that DCF committed extensive ongoing violations to ADA and the Rehabilitation Act. The department found that DCF repeatedly denied Ms. Gordon an equal opportunity to benefit from the agency's reunification services after removing her baby, utilized methods of administration having the effect of discriminating against Ms. Gordon on the basis of disability and defeating or substantially impairing the accomplishments and objectives of its reunification program with respect to Ms. Gordon, and failed to reasonably modify its policies, practices, and procedures where necessary to avoid discriminating against Ms. Gordon on the basis of her disability, all in violation of Title II of the ADA. So the problems that had been identified in the joint letter of findings include assumptions about skills and capacity to learn certain new parenting skills based on Ms. Gordon's ability, failure to permit adequate assistance to learn parenting skills and address unstated concerns, limited visitation and assistance during visitation, hands-on training and modeling limited by visitation schedule outside the home and um, only requiring her to practice on dolls instead of the actual baby or child. Refusal to permit attendance at medical appointments and early intervention services for the child. Refusal to consider opinions of multiple experts, including the child's court-appointed attorney, psychologist, expert psychiatrist, service providers, and DCF's own foster care review panel. DCF ultimately sought to terminate the mother's parental rights However, counsel for the child moved to dismiss the proceedings on the final day of trial based on the department's joint letter of findings. In March 2015, the juvenile court awarded guardianship of the child to the maternal grandmother, so Ms. Gordon's own mother, permitting the child to be reunited with her family over, after over two years of separation. At this time, the department's investigation of Massachusetts DCF is, is ongoing and continues, and so we will have updates for that and we can provide them. Thank you all very, very much. Um, such an informative and insightful conversation today. Um, I hope our audience can hear me. If not, please feel free to send us a chat. Um, in the meantime, just a reminder that you can join our conversation today by hopping on Twitter and using the hashtag Alliance, the number four equity, and also using your control panel to submit questions. And so I'll start off, <clears throat> it's a very process-driven question. People are asking, what are the mechanics of actually filing a complaint? If I am a parent or if I'm a parent's attorney, what do I do to reach your office and to make my concerns known? So you can file a complaint um, in a number of ways. You can <coughs> go to our um, HHS, excuse me, I have to catch my breath, um, HHS um, 
OCR website, which has the complaint portal. And within that portal, we'll have all of the, the forms that you can download or even submit electronically to our staff. You can contact one of us directly by email, uh, well, me, <laughs> and um, this is Carla Carter. And um, you can email it or you can even just make a phone call. And Carla's phone number and email address should be on the screen. It's carla.carter at hhs.gov.gov. We, I'm sorry, go oh, ahead, um, with respect to filing a complaint with the Department of Justice regarding a disability discrimination under the ADA, you can also go to our website, which is ada.gov, and through there, there is a portal to file electronic complaints. And you also have my contact information, and you can also call me or email me as well. Um, but the best way to start the formal process of filing a complaint would be to use our ADA.gov website to do so. That way we can have it officially entered into our system. And if you would like to file a complaint with the Department of Justice about Title VI, you can call our Title VI hotline, which is found on our website. Um, you can also file a complaint, and our complaint form is also on our website. And you can also contact me, Kavon Small, or Dylan DeCavore, and our contact information is on the contact slide. And we will make sure that um, we are responsive. Thank you. We've also gotten quite a few questions about the role of the Indian Child Welfare Act and how we can best preserve the rights of indigenous people or Native Americans through child welfare civil rights compliance. What are thoughts on the role that ICWA plays in light of civil rights legislation? ICWA protects Indian children based on political status, their affiliation with a federally recognized tribe, which is distinct and separate from a racial classification. Our office, the Federal Coordination and Compliance Office, does not enforce ICWA. Um, but Indian children and families are protected by federal civil rights laws if they experience discrimination prohibited by the laws discussed today. And that would also apply to Carla's office and also Brandy's office. So if you do have an ICWA-related question or um, set of facts that you want to discuss with us, the best person to contact would be Dylan DeCavour, who also sits on our Indian Child Welfare Working Group, and she can make sure that um, it's responded to. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else asked that they are interested in how the change of administration is affecting these areas. Do you all have any thoughts on how the new administration has affected civil rights compliance, if at all? Well, funny, we um, get quest, ask, ask this question a lot. This is Kavan from the Department of Justice. And, you know, the laws are still the same. Regardless of administration, the law, as long as the law is valid, we are open for business. We would love to hear from anybody and everybody who believes that they have a set of facts that our, one of our statutes would apply to. So we strongly encourage you to reach out to us, either through our website or through our contact information. Thank you. What are the keys to ensuring that collaborative partnerships are created? You all have definitely been the example between your agencies of a great partnership. What are the keys for folks listening in in the audience to keep in mind about your work together? So our work together, we meet monthly um, or on an as-needed basis to really go over what complaints our respective offices have received. We also really do try to brainstorm creative ways that we can um, help our sister agency, HHS, or our sister office resolve those complaints. And from at least um, the federal coordination and compliance perspective, we also do try to collaborate with the community or the complainants as best as we can understanding that if it's a review or an investigation, we are sort of limited in, in how much information we can give out. But there have been circumstances where we have asked complainants or advocates to submit to us um, things that they think would help resolve the complaint. And some of a complainant or an advocate's concerns or desires or wishes or beliefs about how um, resolution should look have actually been, been incorporated into our resolution agreements with our recipients. Um, our recipients have also been receptive to allowing some of the complainants or their representatives to participate in some of our brainstorming sessions about how we're going to resolve complaints. 
and we have even made um, a measure such as forming a community action board where a community representative or um, an advocate on behalf of a, a community participates in the decision-making process. We understand the need to have better community empowerment or family empowerment, and that's something that we definitely take into consideration and we try to weave it into our work as best as we can. I would also just like to echo the importance of the attorneys and advocates out there reaching out to us. You know, you're on the ground, you're the ones that are hearing the stories, and we have um, so many uh, important matters have come to our attention because advocates or attorneys have brought them to our attention. So we would continue to encourage that kind of open line of communication and feel free to come to us. As Kavan mentioned, um, you know, there may be a limited amount of information we can share if we initiate an investigation, uh, but, but you coming to us and sharing the information with us can help jumpstart um, investigations, and that's a really important role that, that you could play. Great. Agencies have written a lot in, or representatives from agencies have written a lot in about how they can ensure that they are being compliant. And so one question is, are there any steps agencies are required to take to inform in individuals and recipients of their rights? This is Kavan from Federal Coordination Compliance. We do ensure that our recipients, part of, um, if an allegation comes to us, one thing we always look for when we are requesting data from a recipient or collecting data either in person or through documents, we look at how the public is notified about the recipient's, recipient's obligations under Title VI and the services that they provide. Um, we make sure that there is a public awareness campaign or some sort of notification. And also to close the loop on that, we also make sure that there is a complaint process that people who are interfacing with, say, our recipient's office that they often know that there is a way that they can complain about the services because our recipients have to be open to the criticism. So we make sure that not only are they notifying people about the services that they provide and what the recipient's obligation is under Title VI, but also if you don't like how you're being treated, you have to have a way to actually file a complaint. So we, for example, in one particular case, we help them help our recipient establish a complaint system and we ask them to collect a year's worth of complaint information and to share that with us. So not only did we see the type of complaints that were coming into our recipient's office, but then also how they were responding to that. And we use that to further help provide our recipient with technical assistance on how they should be interfacing with the public and also in the type of responses that they were giving to make sure that they were still in further working towards fully complying with Title VI. So hi, this is Carla. Um, so HHS has really done a lot of work probably over the last 20 years um, with a lot of departments of social services where we've worked directly with TANF programs or child care programs or the Medicaid programs to ensure that they have policies and procedures. And we know all of these fall under one umbrella. So it really is important for child welfare agencies to reach across the hall and tap their director of uh, social services to see what's already in existence because a lot of times I don't think there is a state that we haven't hit yet. Um, in part because we have a very aggressive um, compliance program where um, several years ago we were doing compliance reviews in various street sections and working with states. But child welfare has just kind of been out on its own. And so it's really important to find out what's out there um, and if, if there is a need for technical assistance, really to contact the regional offices because that's what they're there for. They know what's happening um, on the ground and, you know, they'll be able to work directly with any, any agency to develop policies. But nine times out of ten, those policies already exist. It's just a matter of linking the various offices with each other. And with respect to uh, DOJ and the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, one of the things that we encourage agencies, child welfare agencies to do is first and foremost, read our um, child welfare guidance um, to be sure that their policies are in line with the guidance and to also, you know, develop um, an ADA policy and to ensure that individuals who are receiving services are aware of that policy. 
And one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that we are statutorily mandated to provide technical assistance. And one of the ways in which we do that is provided through our ADA information line, which um, you can go and find um, the number four on our ADA.gov website. So we encourage you, any agencies or anyone that has any questions about how the ADA applies in the child welfare context, that is one way to, um, to uh, get information is through our ADA information line. And those are all excellent resources. Thank you. And we, we did a question that's more generally around disproportionality and disparities. And the person asked, do any of the civil rights legislation, I think she meant to, he or she meant to say, address the fact that African American children enter care at an increased rate and their stays are longer? Do any of these laws address this? Well, Title IV definitely addresses that. So one thing that we have spent, HHS and DOJ have spent some time on is really trying to figure out how we can use our tool of Title VI to address the disproportionality um, of African American children and also Native American children in the child welfare system. About two years ago, we held a listening session at the Department of Justice main office building and we met with advocates from across the United States to really help us figure out like what's going on on the ground. One thing that we have been trying to find is a case or really have someone bring to us a set of facts that we thought that would help us do our due diligence, write the right justification memo, get it approved in our office to either do a compliance review or a complaint investigation. So we make that pitch again. If there are a set of facts based on race or Native, that also would include Native American children, not just African American children, um, please contact either Carla, Kavan, or Dylan. Um, we definitely would welcome that. We, we know that this is an issue. We do a lot of training around how to do a disparate impact analysis. But one thing that I don't think I highlighted enough in my Title VI presentation was that even if you're, talk, even if you're reading reports and it's talking about disproportionality and you think the only theory or framework you would have would be a disparate impact theory, it can also be an intentional discrimination complaint. Because one factor um, of proving intentional discrimination could be disparity evidence. It doesn't have to be the only factor, but you could say you've been intentionally discriminated against based on your race. And that Supreme Court case called Arlington Heights is a great one for that because it allows you to look at a vast type, different, so many different types of circumstantial evidence. And when you put them all together, the totality of that evidence or those facts could then basically if you imagine putting all these facts into a funnel and then coming out with an intense claim that could be substantiated legally in court, that is what we're looking for. So we really, really welcome anyone who has a set of facts out there that you want to present to us and we can sit down and we can brainstorm how we could look at that either through an intentional discrimination lens or perhaps a disparate impact lens. I think another key factor and why this is so difficult is because you know, there, I mean, there's a lot of research in this area, and I really think it's all over the place. But one of the things that we've been looking at are, are what are there any specific practices or policies that are creating this kind of impact? And when we're having discussions with folks, um, you know, it's really hard for, pe for people to put their fingers on it. And certainly, you know, as um, members of the African American community, um, parents have a difficult time, you know, pointing, you know, what is, what is, what is happening. And so a lot of it can be fact-driven, um, but I suspect that there are some policies out there that are being used in the child welfare context. And so I challenge you to kind of think about, you know, what are the kind of policies that make, um, make a set of facts turn different for um, families of color. Um, because that, I think that's going to be really key to our work. Um, because if it's happening in one state, it's happening someplace else. And we know that um, child welfare policies are not validated. So there's a lot of bias that goes into play when folks are making decisions. But it's hard to put your hand on bias. But you can put your hand on a policy that is more prone to bias. And so I think that that's something that um, we'd be very interested in um, to support those facts that are also jumping out at folks. Thank you for that. Um, my head is spinning because I think you all just gave such great information and, and definitely the role of bias and the role of those 
practices that may seem race neutral that have a disparate impact, both little DNI and big DNI, in the way that you all use it in light of civil rights legislation, is something that we have to keep in mind. And so we encourage people who have tuned in today to please take um, the whole group, Dylan, Kavon, Carla, and Brandy up on their offer to learn more about their work, to share a set of facts or practices that you have seen in your jurisdiction and state um, that you believe may be infringing upon family civil rights. We thank you for tuning in and we ask that you please visit our website at cssp.org to learn more about our work here at the Center and the Alliance for Racial Equity and Child Welfare and to also join our mailing list. If you've not already, please don't forget to download all of the resources that accompany this webinar to learn more about federal civil rights compliance and child welfare. And also we will make sure that this presentation is available to you all after today's recording has been downloaded. Thank you all.